Hello guys and welcome back to Huddle Automotive where you join us for another car review. This car review of course is on my new E46 330D. Well I say new, it's new to me. I've done about 3,000 miles on it and I think it's about time for a car review. And you join us in Spain, not England. I've just driven this 1,300 miles to Spain and uh, I think that's given me a good enough idea to tell you what it's like. So. In advance, we're just going to quickly apologise. I have no microphone on me, so you might get a little bit of wind noise. But anyway, to recap, we've got a couple of videos on this car already, so some of you already know what it is. But I'll run past it for those of you that don't. It's a 330D manual, so it makes around 204 horsepower, 410 newton meters of torque, and it's quite actually it's quite fun being a manual car as well. So it's obviously a touring. It's got leather, all of those kind of things. Uh, North 6 is about 7.2 seconds quoted. It's definitely worse than the Golf that I had before as a daily driver, is in considering uh, fuel economy, but it's way better in performance. And you can, it's still got enough power that you can get the rear end out, especially in Spain where the roads are a little bit more glossy. Now you join me in the car in quite a bit of a different location. We're now in France, uh, quite some miles later. In a small village just outside Le Mans, I think now, You'll have to bear with me if we have a couple of cuts because I am also navig navigating my way through some French towns. So you know roughly the story of the car. I mean, I've had it not very long now, but I have done just about 5,000 miles in it now, coming up to 5,000 miles, probably 4,500 miles in it. So I should have a good idea on this car. And I have driven quite a few E46s before. This review is gonna be about my 330D mainly, but I'm also gonna dive in a little bit deeper or a little bit into the E46 as a platform in general because I have a lot of love for this platform. So as I went through the engine and transmission in, in Spain, to drive with, the engine and transmission is lovely. It's got loads of torque all the way through the power band and from you can cruise from sort of 1500 RPM you're going to be fine and sitting at 75 80 it's it's pretty pretty darn good the economy i think possibly taking a little bit of a downturn because i'm not sure the thermostat is completely working uh sometimes can be a bit iffy but we've got roughly 40.9 mpg um of the last tank and i think 39 overall the whole trip so that's including quite a lot of little Spanish town runs as well so I don't think it's too bad as an average for a three litre diesel engine and considering the grunt it has got it's got loads of grunt uh, down low and it's perfect for this kind of driving having you know just doing loads and loads of motorway miles it is really really good for that the three litre diesel in this car the M57 with the manual box is still engaging to drive and it's still a fun fun car to drive it's not as fun as a 330i but it has more torque than a 330i which can always be as fun and also a great big benefit of a 3 litre diesel engine if you're not in the ULE zone is that it is much better on fuel it's getting 40 to the gallon which is is pretty darn good you can if you if you drive very I mean I'm not driving massively responsibly to get that I'm just just driving you have to drive quite responsibly with a 30i to get 30 plus mpg let's just put it that way i mean if it's an automatic as well forget about it it's just terrible you always get the 30 anyway on a handling and comfort front there's a constant i suppose to buckle in the comments with our f10 verse e60 video and i own the f10 5 series and this is not as comfortable as that and neither is the e60 they're both not as comfortable as that however the e60 a little bit more engaging to drive than the F10. I suppose the E39 is more engaging to drive than that, but particularly this E46 is a bit smaller, it's a three series. I think these E46, the E46 in general, almost all of them, especially the spicier you get, are just so great to drive. They're so, they're, they're more than comfortable enough for everything you need to do. They're, they're, they are comfy cars, there's, there's a nice build quality to them and they're really lovely to drive in that way. But the handling is actually responsive. The handling you can actually play with. It's a rear wheel drive platform and 
I've had the back end out in this car. You can do it. I mean, this is a 30, 30 D, so it's got enough grunt to do so. But, you know, I've had the 325 eyes and I've had quite a few of them. And, and you can have fun and you can feel what's going on. And it's it's really, especially with, a, with me driving my F10 all the time, like there's nothing wrong with my F10. There's nothing really wrong with modern cars in general. They're just pretty much perfect. But in the same way, they're not really engaging at all, even for, you know, the more spicy ones as well. I mean, I'm not, it's not to say that they're, they're, they're completely bad. I mean, I, lo I love the E92 M3. It's probably my, one of my favorite M cars there is. But in the same way, just doing normal driving, if you compare the this 46, I'm just talking on, a, on an engagement front, just especially this one being manual, is just something really nice about the 2001 to 2005 sort of generation BMWs between your, or the E46, E39, that kind of era of BMW. Just draw, I just love the way they drive. Just love it. It's, they're just so engaging and you can still have fun with it. You can still enjoy it, but you're not sacrificing too much comfort, which is why I like the BMW in general, because the Mercedes, they're very comfortable. For, for example, this era especially, the Mercedes are very comfortable, but I wouldn't say they're engaging to drive as much. And the same with the Audis, they're kind of a bit understeery. This is not understeery, it's not understeery at all. If you turn the traction control off and you're going in quick to a bend, you can get the back end can come out, you know, if you put too much throttle on, you know, you can really play with it, you can play around with it massively, and that's that's what I love about it. And you have some communication, and this is a an SE, you know, it's not an M3, it's not an M Sport. This is just an SE chassis, so, and it's got two four fives on the back, and it's still, you know, it's, it's not a handful, it's it's just playful. The gearboxes are, are not the most engaging, I can't lie to you. I mean, it's a manual gearbox, it's nice, obviously, than having an automatic, but the gearbox itself, they're, I would call them rubbery, but they're not massively engaging like a Honda, for example. The drawbacks you get with Japanese cars is often, for example, our Accord, it's pretty comfy, I can't lie, but I wouldn't call the handling exciting. It, it handles really well, but really, really well, but it's not exciting, it's not exciting handling. You just, you're quite surprised at how much grip it's got, but it's not like an EP3 Type R where the back end steps out every time you lift off the throttle. I don't want this to be taken the wrong way. I'm not saying this car is better than new cars, because it's, especially in a daily driver term, it's quite clearly not. However, if you want a car that can be daily driven and is still refreshingly engaging to drive and can be played with and can, you know, the trash control can be turned off and you feel inquisitive too, or you might even want to take it to a track day or you might want to take it to the Nürburgring and it still be quite engaging and doesn't feel that numbness that a lot of new cars have. These BMs are, are, are I think, the last great BMs for that. And there's nothing wrong with the new BMs. You've got to say they're so amazing. I mean, the, the M cars now are so fast and they, you know, they tick so many boxes for so many people. But unless it's an M car, maybe the engine giving you that. And I don't think, for me personally, the steering and everything else around it gives you that much back in comparison to something like this or the E36. And handling comfort is a great balance in the E46 for all of them, the coupes, the estates, you know, the lot of them, they're, they're still, as an estate, you can still enjoy it, which is, which is more than can be said for a lot, a lot of estates. I think these have aged so well inside and they're still so lovely to drive and no, it's not the quietest thing on the motorway, but it's, it's never going to annoy you. It's not like it's overly loud. I think probably most of the the volume comes from the tyres, but the wind noise is very minimal. It's, it's a comfortable amount of noise, but if you don't have music, you can you're aware of aware of the wind noise. Let's put it that way. Now, another reason I love this car and I love the E46, and I'm so impressed with these cars is at the moment the diesels are still quite cheap. Three litre diesels and the two litre diesels are still. Uh, well, two litres are very cheap of the E46 platform, and they are so good. And it's they're, they're great cars to buy, uh, with a caveat, which I'll go into later. 
but the prices for those cars, I mean, for this car with about 100,000 miles that it has now, um, in, obviously I need to do a little bit more to make this into clean, clean condition, but it could probably fetch two, two and a half, because it, it's not an M Sport, so the M Sports are worth quite a bit more money, um, um, which is a lot more than it used to be. So you could definitely pick up these cars for a lot less before. Um, and I think they've already gone up since I bought this one. And the petrol cars, especially if you get in a coupe version, not on estate, the estates in the saloons are a lot cheaper, but the coupe versions, not so much the convertibles, but the coupe 330 Ci, for example, manual, are really starting to go four, five, six, sometimes more now on the, on the market. So definitely time to pick up an E46 platform if you've never tried one, because they are great, great cars. And, you know, for what you get for the money, they tick all the boxes. Yes, Cameron and I are, do love our 520Ds and our 5 Series models because they do tick every single box. However, you cannot say they're the most dynamic, but the E46 chassis is extremely dynamic. And I'd say the E39 chassis is pretty dynamic, but if you want a bit more handling and a bit more playfulness, go for the 3 Series and when you've got a big engine in them, you feel a bit more of the difference. There is a caveat though, to buying an E46 or an E39. You've got to remember, I, I, I grew up with these cars and they obviously they were new when I was a lot younger. Obviously, I mean, I, I had a few a couple of years ago and they weren't so old, but now I still, I think they look good in this say, I mean, they don't, they definitely don't look new, They, but I think they've aged well and I think they will become a bit of a classic but that nevertheless with modern classics or with older cars as this car is older now this one for a particular example is a later one in 2004 you can obviously get them all the way from 2001 this is a 2004 car this is going to be 16 17 years old which does bring its own issues so yes they can be found quite cheap but I would say if you don't know how to work on them or you don't know, at least know how to service your car, I would probably consider against it maybe and try and find something else a little bit less maintenance heavy because these BMs just doing simple maintenance can get pretty hefty. And considering that they're still cheap at the moment, maybe they're gonna be a bit more expensive later. And if you get a nicer example, it might be worth it, but you don't wanna be going getting this thing serviced and it costs you 400, 500 pounds and you've only spent two grand on the car anyway then. Just to service, you've already spent a quarter of the price of the car. So I would say make sure you know you can work on the cars a little bit because stuff like seize, seize calipers and you've also got to look out for rust, many other things. This is not going to be a how to buy one of these cars as a review, but it just needs to be said that yes, they are cheap, but before you rush out and buy one, they are not maintenance free by any means. Yes, they're a cheap car, but they are not necessarily cheap to run. Diesel ones might be cheap on fuel, but stuff like EGR problems and things like that are gonna add up if you're not doing it all yourself. So keep that in mind. On that same thing, you gotta remember that all BMWs, I mean, they still do now, but especially of this era, do love a good leak so if you don't want to be chasing leaks your whole life probably e46 not the best way to go for that now as a road trip car this car has done like really 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 well um, so we've done we've, I think is around when all the ended up going all the way to Marbella um, which I'd actually calculate the mileage completely but the thing is going to be somewhere in the four four grand four thousand miles We've done on this car um, and to my big surprise it hasn't leaked or burned any oil which is the first time I've ever seen that on an E46 completely gobsmacked and I'm quite scared something's wrong to be honest um, but yeah amazing on that front and I've had no issues anyway I mean you know, knock on wood I've still got another six hours to the border yet but everything has been really really great and it's you know I've never felt that anything bad is going to go wrong but it has had its problems 
So, I mean, sorry, it's had its niggles, shall I say. And this is the kind of E46, kind of old BMW stuff I'm talking about, old car stuff I'm talking about. The washer tank, for example, leaks. So, yes, I fill it up just before I leave, uh, and I'll give it a couple of washes, um, but gradually it will leak in about a day and a half, two days. So that needs to be fixed. And I can possibly hear just a slight, slight knock in the, uh, the water pump. So that could possibly be coming up as well. And this is just kind of the example I'm trying to set to you that I love these cars and I think they are great, great, great cars to own, but I would only own one if I was willing to get my hands dirty and start working on it myself. And on my way down, the rear brakes are now ready to be changed, uh, even though we've, we've done the front and the rear brakes now. The brake wear indicator has come up on the dash, so that is something else that needs to be done. But overall, I'm very, very, very happy with this car. Uh, it's got a little bit of smoke time to time. I think that was from the injector, maybe a little bit uh, clogged up a little bit from just from use in London, basically. But other than that, it drives really nice. It's nice and tight, and just a testament to how how nice these cars are. And they, they can go on for a really, really long time if you look after them. So as I was trying to get to a nice place for the outro, I thought I'd just quickly mention this. The 330, not the worst of off-roading apparently, as you can see. But outro here is going to have to do. I just love these generation BMWs from 2000 to 2005. That generation of BMW, whether it's the the E46, the E39 M5, uh, uh, sorry, 5 series, and I'd love an M5, one of those. The uh, even the X5 of the era, you know, um, the Z uh, the Z3. Uh, it's just all good from that era. I, I like all of them, and uh, especially this one an e46 soft spot in my heart for that anyway until next time please like please subscribe i hope you enjoyed the video we will see you soon Would I buy one in comparison to what else or the rivals that are from around the time or possibly the same kind of money? So you're looking at sort of like A4s and C-classes C, uh, C and possibly stuff like the Honda Accord. Now the Honda Accord is a great car and it's extremely reliable and probably going to be a lot less hassle than this would ever be. However, the Honda Accord we bought because we're going to do something to it. And we enjoy it because it's got the VTEC and different things like this, but I don't, I think I could, the camera might agree with me here, but to own as a car every day and we weren't going to do anything to it, I'm almost certain he'd take an E46. He would take an E46. The Accord is a little bit bigger in the back. That's one thing I've got to say is the rear wheel drive in this definitely does take up some space in the rear area. Um, which is something you might want to bear in mind. But in comparison to the A4 as well, this is, for me, hands down, this is a, is, is, is a better car. Um, the A4 is, a, you can get some nice engines, a two litre turbo in the A4 and, and uh, maybe the 3.2 V6. But for me, as, as, as a car, hands down, this is an old car I'd, I'd still buy and I still love and enjoy at the moment. The A4, I think definitely the C-Class is out of the question. It's just, unless it's a 32 AMG or something funky or, or, or cool, um, no, just no, just no real point, real point for it. it just, the E-Class is a much better car in every way and, and the C-Class is not particularly dynamic in any way, either, any way, shape or form. The, obviously, if you want four-wheel drive, you're gonna have to go for an A4. So, 
that's probably all I'll say on that. Is if you're in the market for an estate of this kind of size and that's your kind of budget, I think hands down this is the best car out, uh, best car around this kind of budget. But that's for me. That's for me. I, I like. I like. I like driving this every day. I like being in it. So um, I'm willing to to fork up for the for the extra maintenance. I suppose you should say, or I'm ready to do the extra maintenance myself.